right, so we will continue with the, what we were doing, which was the analyzing uh, in what space our mechanisms move. And uh, basically, that is important. I mean, it's not so difficult when we have serial mechanisms. It's basically important when we have parallel mechanisms or closed loop mechanisms, right? So we have three. Let's say for, for uh, serial chains, it's okay, right? Serial chains. It's easy. And these are the ones that we want to end up with in the synthesis process right now. That's the strategy we are following. But if we have uh, closed loop chains, You know, you may have some uh, arrangement of, of joints that, in principle, it seems that they move in the whole space. And when you connect those legs, the actual uh, workspace is much reduced, and it may be reduced not only in volume but also in what motions are allowed to be to be performed. Right? There are basically three types of closed loop chains, and we haven't covered that. So let me just tell you that quickly. There are one that are trivial. The ones that we call trivial closed loop chains are those that, you know, if you have two, so okay. here's your base, ground, right? base, ground, and here you have one leg, so you know how, however many joints you want to put, and here you have the other leg. They may have different number of joints, it doesn't matter, and here is your So this is a loop, and you can think of a you know, path and another path. Okay. So a trivial closed loop chain like this one is that that if you look at the, you know, the, the the subspace of motions of this one, it's either the same or fully contained or fully contains the subspace of the other one. Okay. So trivial. Uh, and uh, we'll, let's talk about something. Group of motions, motion. Let's call this one chain or path one, and this will be path two. Okay. So a group of motions one equal to subgroup. of motion two. Remember, we are talking about what is the group in which its motion is contained. You know, the set of motions may be smaller, <coughs> but what is the minimum subgroup that contains those? That's that's what we are talking about here, right? It's either equal or or one contained on the other. One contained in the other. So that means if we represent it graphically, we'll say, okay, this is the subgroup of motion of chain one, for instance, and then subgroup of motion of chain two may be equal, or it may be fully contained on that one. Okay. This is what we call the trivial change. Why? Because what you have to do is just take one of them. If the both are equal, then you can take either one or the other and discard the other one for our design purposes. If one is more restrictive, just keep that one. Okay? And you will know that this one can reach any motion of that one, so you are okay. All right? So this is why this case is trivial. So for us, in a tri trivial case, take, take one chain. The, more rest the most restrictive. And we know that the other one will be able to do those motions if we take the most restrictive. Or if they are equal also, we know that the other one will be able to perform those motions. 
These are the easy ones. But this is not always the case. Okay. Then we have what we call the exceptional closed loop chains. And what we have is that the intersection that is what we are doing, right? We are doing we are looking at the motions of this chain the subgroup of motions, we are looking at the subgroup of motions of this, and the intersection will be the motion that this, uh, the, 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 that the set of motions of the end detector will be on, right? So when we have an exceptional single chain, the intersection is not fully contained, you know, one is not fully contained in the other, okay? So the intersection, section, which is different from It's easy to, to, we can prove that, right? So this is actually a subgroup of motion that is not not of this, okay? Smaller than both, it's contained of in both, okay? What do we, this is the case of the Savos mechanism that we saw, remember? We had three revolute joints which were parallel in this direction, so you could actually create this kind of motion so this had a subgroup, and then you had another one where work which were perpendicular to that. Yes. Okay. And this can create another subgroup of motion, and when you, when you join them together, okay, then the intersection of them is just the subgroup of motions of a translation about an axis which is perpendicular to both. So that we are talking about this. This is an exceptional serial chain. When we find one of these, then we cannot use one leg or the other. We need to just toss both of them and create a virtual equivalent serial chain that has that particular workspace. So for instance, this one is substituted with a prismatic. Yes, with a prismatic uh, joint, which can do the same motion as, as this one. So in this case, substitute with serial chain having the uh, same subgroup of motion. How do we do? How do we know this? How do we know what it is a group of motion of this one? Uh, we, we, usually, we, we do it in the Lie algebra. So we look at this axis. We see what kind of sub algebra they generate. We look at this axis. We look at what sub algebra they generate, and then we just intersect those. We see which elements of the bases are common to all, both of them, right? And we create that, the subalgebra that intersection that's equivalent to a subgroup. We look at which group that's equivalent or which subgroup, and then we think of what, or we can do everything in the algebra. We can find you know, an axis that corresponds to that, and that in this case it will be the prismatic joint. And now that I remember, I told you that I was going to give you this list of subalgebras, and I did have that one, uh, but I didn't bring it. Let me just give you the reference, okay? But let me just finish this. I'll, I'll, I'll do that in just a second. So these are the exceptional ones. 
So we have we have been able to you know uh, convert the trivial ones in a single serial chain. This is one of the legs. The exceptional ones in a sim simple serial chain. We're doing the substitution of equivalent motion. And then the, the last ones that we have with another type is, are the paradoxical. Just the name should tell you that these are not good. Paradoxical linkages, closed loops. These are uh, closed loops which um, well we cannot we cannot compute intersection easily because they depend on specific geometry. So for these ones, we need to look at case by case. Uh, motion. Motion. Um, specific geometry. And this we have to do case by case. So that some of those, some of these paradoxicals, you can just take one leg and it works. Some of them you can't. So let's forget about these ones. These are complicated. Okay. But basically, looking at each case, or just doing the substitution, substitution in the sub algebra, or just taking one leg, we can convert closed loop in an open serial chain for synthesis purposes. Let me give you a couple of references for this uh, for this information. Okay. information about that and, and Fangel and Galetti they also have the list of sub this of sub algebras of the D algebra S C three. Okay? So that's also an interesting thing to, to see. Alright, so let's assume we have been able to convert everything to serial chains based on knowing you know, that the sub algebras correspond to sub groups and how to calculate those sub algebras which is a lot to assume, right? So, we have been able Just 
answer this simple question, right? All right. If it's a serial chain, then we know that our design equations are going to be the equations that we will use for, at least in general, without talking about the tree structure, be the product of exponentials. position we want to reach, to the displacement we want to reach, and, and we do a relative. So we do the P12, P13, P1, right? So now we have to count. Counting. And let me just take my notes because I want to use the same notation as the paper. Okay. The number of variables that we have here. those n x. We have n minus 1 times the number of joint variables plus the number of structural variables. So n a, n j, number of joint that will appear in our equation, whether they are independent or not, they will appear, right? And S, number of structural variables. So joint variables are theta 1, theta 2, theta n, okay? Theta 1 for position J, theta n, J. So we have m minus 1. So we have this n j times the number of positions minus 1, right? It's kind of redundant, right? This j is colliding with that j. n sub j. Okay, it's a bad notation. They are not related. and minus one. But this just means number of joints. So if you want to come to the end, J data. Okay. So the number of structural variables are the variables coming here in the joint axis. And We are talking about prismatic joint, just two independent variables. So four for a double joint, two for a prismatic joint. Okay. If we have specific cases, this NJ is not directly the sum of all two joints. If, for instance, all the joints are coupled together, or there's uh, some other condition on them, this number needs to be calculated based on that. Okay. Add joint variable constraints. the equations. So what we call the number of equations is equal to nf and this is equal 
equal to number of positions times d plus c. And here is the only difference, because this d is equal to the dimension of our linkage lock to space that we talked about last day. Okay. So what this tells you is you can create as many equations as positions, but with the degree of freedom of the space in which you are moving. Okay. And then the C is the number of the number of additional constraints. If you have some conditions, for instance, these two axes have to be parallel, okay, or these two axes intersect, these are additional constraints that you need to add. So now we just equate this two and create our formula. And it will be equal to NS minus C divided by B minus NJ plus 1. Okay. So that is the maximum number of positions we can reach. Maximum number of arbitrary displacements. And then it solves those equations and gives you your results. That is available right now. It's available, yes, yes. And we are going to use it in this class. And it's okay. now finally yeah. working. So after just yes, two more lectures, I think today and maybe next day, we can start using it to practice. Okay? So yeah, we will got we will get into the practical thing. And that software has to be, you know, it's under development. So you guys will have to once you know how to use it. And once you know the theory, you will have to make it more more general. So one thing for instance this is not this is not implemented right now in the software. It doesn't calculate this number automatically. You have to calculate it and add the positions. But if you don't put the right positions then it will be solving forever and we'll never find a solution. For instance if you put too many. Or if you put too little then you know everything will be a solution. So yeah we'll have to we'll have to keep working on that. So so far we haven't, you know, we haven't even got into how to solve those equations. We are still trying to state the equation. We need this number m in order to create this set of equations. Because we'll have as many sets as, as m minus one. Okay. Yeah, we'll get we'll get there, little by little. Um, yes. So we calculated m, but there's one more thing that we have to look into is that there are some limitations. M does not give, not always give the right, the, the right answer. Why is that? Because we have the group of, of uh, special displacements, SE3, the group of motions, 
it's actually a semi-direct product of oh, rotations and translations. We never talk about sem semi-direct product. And when you have a direct product, that means that you take an element from this subgroup, an element from this subgroup, and then you combine them and you get a general element. But this kind of multiplies together, and this multiplies together, they don't mix. Okay? But this is not a direct product, this is a semi-direct product, which means that the rotations, they kind of operate by themselves. So rotation times a rotation give you a rotation. However, when you multiply, so if you multiply a, a translation times a rotation, then you get always translation. Okay? So the rotations gives you also translations. Right? So here you have an axis you are rotating about. So this point is changing orientation, but it's also changing position, right? Which means that you know translations actually affect sorry, orientations affect or rotations affect translations, translations do not affect rotation, right? Due to this, okay, due to this phenomenon, we can actually have some chains that are fully defined for rotations but not for translations. So we need to calculate one more number of M. We need to calculate the maximum number of rotations that the system can, can do. And it has the same formula, NSR minus CR divided by VR minus NJR, where VR now is the dimension of the linkage local space intersected with those that only affect rotations. Okay. Number of structural parameters, this is just the rotation axis, and it's only for revolutions. Two, four, R joints, and prismatic joints don't count, because they don't give rotation. Well, NJ will be the same, and then the C will be J R is equal to the number of rotational variables. If you have a, a slide that, of course, doesn't count. Okay. okay. So with this, now we have everything that we need. Okay. More or less. There are other specific cases. It seems that it never ends. But summarizing. Summary. the algorithm that we need to implement in, in the software, okay? If the number of rotations that are allowed is greater or equal than the total number of positions, and the total number of positions is a rational, positive rational number, then we can do the synthesis with n. for instance, for three rotations, but M gives us five complete displacements, okay? And all the numbers M, M, R, I just have given you the other one anyway, are rational, so that means they're solvable. Then it is solvable. 
but not for M, for MR. MR, arbitrary positions. Arbitrary orientation. The orientation is fixed, is whatever it needs to be. Okay? Plus, plus uh, translations and N, N minus MR translations. Imagine that you get MR equal 3, N equal 5. So you will say, okay, I'm going to solve for three positions, full, fully arbitrary positions, and then we will have some more that the translation is fully arbitrary, but the orientation will be given by, by the linkage, basically, by your topology. and we haven't covered that yet. I should have. So I should have covered that too. Let me just put it here as a note. In some cases, in some cases, we have too many joints for translation. Uh, translation. defining the translational part of it. So this is pretty much what we need to do, just yeah? looking at this M, MR, and uh, there's another one which is MT for the translations, which you can see in, in the paper that I'll upload soon. So after after this class, you should be, it should be very easy for you to read the whole paper. We are just covering step by step. And we just go through this algorithm and then we can see how many positions we need. Okay, finally we have the number of positions. All right. So now we are going to do this same thing but apply it to three synthesis. Okay. Okay. 
number of positions that we are solving for. But this M is the one we calculate. So K I remember K I is equal to the number of common joints joints for branch I and then N I is the total number of joints. several branches so we have to calculate for each branch we have to calculate that maximum number of positions because each branch will have different number of joints so now we have to do what, what if we get different number of positions for each what do we do right so what we are going to do now is we are going to take that formula for the maximum number of positions and we are going to use the, the matrices of the graph of the tree graph in order to calculate the formula for that and uh, then we will look at what kind of subgraphs we can we can find in there. And this is where we left the class today because I don't have the, the other part prepared, which is looking at the graph structure. Okay, but now we are ready to start working on on the tree synthesis. Okay. So you see, it's a short class today, <laughs> but uh, you know we can take these ten minutes if you guys want to clarify anything that we have done so far. And it wasn't very clear. Right? 